Okay, thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers. So let's get going. Um, this is based on three things. One is uh, a little old, but this was, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Lars Grossedijk, who asked me, quest who introduced me to Tensor Network States and asked me about um, whether uh, it was a, the set of t all Tensor Network States formed a closed set. And uh, I was able to answer that with my students in a special case, which I thought was enough. Um, and then th part of the talk is going to be based on a, a paper with my formal student, Gismundo and Michael Walter. Uh, the main point of this paper was to point out some conjectures in the quantum information community were uh, very false. But um, in that paper, we did some exploration of the geometry of tensor network states and as a side result in that paper. And that'll be what comes up in today's talk. And finally, I'd like to talk about some work in progress with Thomas Bartol and um, Amy Huang. Uh, because of that first paper, Thomas came up to me and said, well, that's a nice paper, but the tensor network states I care about don't look like the ones you discussed in the article. What can you say about the um, tensor network states that show up in nature, or at least the nature that Thomas explores? So let me establish some notation. I'm only going to work with one graph today, a cycle with n nodes. And um, there'll be two types of tensor network states, the general one, uh, so the M in this talk is the bond dimension, the size of the matrices. D is the physical dimension. Our um, output tensor will live in CD tensor to the N. And we eat uh, N tensors in CM tensor CM tensor CD, and it spits out a tensor in that gigantic space of size D to the N. And if the tensors are indexed by i, i goes from 1 to n, then um, we obtain our big tensor whose coefficients are the traces of the various products of the matrices that I can get out of the little tensors. So this should be fairly familiar. Is there any questions on my notation here? No, and please just interrupt with questions as you have them. Uh, Cecile will unmute you as fast as possible, hopefully. Okay, so an easy back of the envelope calculation says that we're in this enormous space of D to the N, and the image is of roughly N times D times M squared. And um, as a geometer, I immediately ask several questions. What this ambient space has a very well studied geometry. And what's the geometry of the image of the set of tensors that I can get in this way? It fills some tiny little corner of this enormous space. What does that corner look like? And is the image closed? That was Thomas's question, and that was um, Grassi Dyke's question, and we'll be discussing that today. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are interested in algebraic geometry, uh, in this situation, the closure undertaking limits, the standard Euclidean closure, agrees with the Zariski closure given by polynomials, zero sets of polynomials. And the other type of tensor networks uh, want to talk about are the cyclically invariant ones where you place the same tensor at each vertex. So again, now we, we only eat one tensor and we get a corresponding element of our big tensor space. Um, so it looks like this. Again, you just take various traces. And because trace is invariant under cyclic permutation, um, so, of course, trace of x, y, z is equal to trace of z, x, y. Uh, 
the image tensors we get are forced to be cyclically invariant. So I use this superscript Zn. The Zn is the group of cyclic permutations. And my image is certainly forced to behave, to live in there because of this identity about traces. And again, a back of the envelope calculation tells you it's of dimension roughly D times M squared. And again, we're in this enormous space. And we have similar questions. What subset of the cyclically invariant tensors does it fill? And in this case, it's not even clear whether or not it lies in a proper linear subspace. So over the weekend, I asked 86 experts uh, via this um, Slack chat, and no one volunteered that this was known. So um, this appears to be an open question. And I think it's a very good open question for someone here to work on. Uh, certainly, it would be possible to make progress on it, if not answer it completely. I think this is very interesting. And again, is the image closed? Any questions about either of these notations? OK. All right, so um, the first uh, proposition, really, this is pretty easy, is if your bond dimension is enormous, which is not what typically happens in the states that are studied in physics or chemistry, then in fact, uh, you do span the entire space. Um, I'm asking if the space of Zn invariant tensor network states spans the space of Zn invariant tensors, not whether it's equal to it. If it's equal to it, we can do that by dimension count, or at least uh, a large open subset of it. The question in the chat um, is, it's my question is about the span of the image. So if you take a space curve, normally it will fill out its span will fill out the space, even though it's a tiny little curve. Other questions? Okay, but the real issue here is what about small m? And that is, I think now I can say with reasonable confidence, an open question. Next, quote, next result uh, is this old theorem with my students, um, Yang Chi and Kuya. If, um, your um, dimension D, your physical dimension is sufficiently large, then this is not closed um, in either situation. And what Tomas asked me at the start of this program is what about when D is small? Because that's in physics, I'm told you mostly care about D equal to two. And then um, the work in progress is a first step in that direction. Um, at least when your bond dimension is also small, um, uh, then uh, when the bond dimension is also small, uh, then it is not closed uh, if n is greater than five. So, Sorry, I cannot look at an archive preprint uh, while I'm lecturing. So um, we're hoping to prove, to extend this result uh, to arbitrary um, m, uh, as long as our um, n, the number of sites, is at least a constant times m, and we expect that constant is at most three. So that is work in progress. I am not hoping not to stick out my neck too much because we're being recorded, but uh, we're hopeful about that. And um, I don't use the word soon here, but I think it's not unreasonable to also hope to prove that um, the general case is not closed either, at least when N is some function of M. Okay, so any questions? Uh, this is the statements. So if I run out of time, you know all the statements. <laughs>
Okay. So um, I'm a geometer. So let's do some geometer, geometry, sorry. Uh, let's talk about the space of all cyclically invariant tensors sitting inside the space of all tensors. So I'm going to be like the quantum people, give my vector spaces names, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, except I think there's only going to be Alice in this talk. Uh, so um, in our large tensor space, we have two groups that act. We have the group of changes of bases. So that's, I denote GLA, just the invertible D by D matrices act on this space. And the permutation group, which permutes the factors. These two actions commute with each other which has some interesting consequences. Now inside the group of all permutations is the group of cyclically invariant uh, permutations. Oh, by the way, um, just as a sanity check, what if I, so we're interested in the cyclically invariant tensors. What if I asked about the tensors invariant under the entire permutation group. Little quiz. Well, this is by definition the um, symmetric tensors. So being cyclically invariant when you only have two factors, well, then you have the full permutation group. So exactly you get the symmetric tensors, the symmetric matrices, in fact. For three, it gets a little more interesting. If you have a cyclically invariant three-way tensor, of course, you're always going to have symmetric for any um, n. But here we also pick up the space of skew symmetric tensors. And that'll be true whenever n is odd. Um, when we go to the fourth uh, n equals four, then you, we get some other things that show up. For those of you who are not familiar with this notation, this is simply the space of, um, well, if we think of sim 2a as the space of quadratic polynomials, we have the quadratic polynomials in quadratic polynomials, and we have the skew forms in skew forms. So the geometry starts getting richer as n gets larger. And of course, um, we expect the cyclically invariant tensors to be roughly one over one over n, the size of the full space of tensor, so a very large space. And it'll become more and more interesting as n grows. In general, for people familiar with the notation, we have these two groups that act on our big space. We can chop up our gigantic space into spaces that are um, submodules for this group or for these pair of groups. And that's a well studied object. I will not discuss it in detail today, we don't have time. But if we, you are familiar with the notation, there is an explicit description in terms of representation theory of the cyclically invariant tensors. So you don't need to know what any of this notation means. All you need to know is that there's a recipe that if you hand me N, I can give you an extremely explicit description of the cyclically invariant tensors in that, tank, in that case, just as I did for the first three cases. Questions? Yeah, so, um, and this space will still be acted on okay, by the change. I, I, I do have a question. So, so what is the motivation for looking at the cyclically invariant ones? Well, that is the home of the um, MPS with periodic, 
specific boundary conditions where you stick the same tensor at each site. So I want to know what kind of tensors I can get with a when my graph is a ring and I stick the same tensor at each site and I construct an, a tensor from that via what we've been talking about this whole workshop. So that has a home. And its home is roughly one over n, the size of the space of all tensors. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what that home is. That's the first question I, I would ask as a geometer. And what I'm telling you is there's an algorithmic way for any fixed n to give an extremely explicit description of this subset. Does that answer the question? OK, other questions? <clears throat> Okay, so now this space of cyclically invariant tensors, say you have your standard basis, I would rather not work with that basis. Um, so we can take bases, basis vectors that um, are eigenvectors or simultaneous eigenvectors for our group action. That is to say, if we act by a cyclic permutation, then it'll just get um, and this omega will depend on sigma, of course. Um, it'll act by some nth root of unity. So it'll just get multiplied by a scalar times itself. And that scalar is just some root of unity. And, but we can insist moreover that each of our basis vectors lies in, I told you that representation representation theory allows us to chop up our space under the action of change of bases. And we can also insist that our basis is combat compatible with that chopping action. And I would like to make the case to you that this is really a good way to study the initial questions that I asked at the start of the talk. So our basis vectors will be marked in two different ways. Now, if I did not want to be so fancy, the natural way you would write down basis elements is just you take a simple tensor and then you hit it with all cyclic permutations and you take the sum of those. And that of course is a perfectly good uh, element of a perfectly good cyclically invariant tensor. And um, it's easy to see how to construct those from, if this is your seed tensor, um, so I, I allow x1 to be any, oh, here it is, xj can be any element of my vector space. And I take this kind of um, matrices that look like this with a one non-zero entry, then, um, this will give me uh, exactly these vectors from this tensor as soon as m is greater than or equal to n, and that gives a proof of that proposition I said earlier. But I want to say that I think one can say something much stronger if you um, take into account more information. This is only taking into account very uh, lightweight information. Oh, that's what I was just suggesting. Okay, so let me give a proof of this theorem uh, because evidently it was not well known. Uh, so hopefully it'll be slightly better well known after this talk. So I want to talk about the iterated matrix multiplication tensor. So I think of this space of tensors. This is the space of M by M matrices and um, a tensor I can think of as a multilinear form. So this, an element of this space should be something that eats n m by m matrices and spits out a number. So an iterated matrix multiplication tensor eats n matrices and spits out the trace of their product. And of course, uh, what we get is cyclically invariant, and moreover, it sits inside, it, it is actually can be realized via the tensor network construction. So um, now I write my space 
my CD, I want to think of D is equal to M squared. So I want to think of my space as a space of M by M matrices. And M is also my bond dimension. So my tensor will sit inside this A, tensor this bond dimension, tensor CM dual. My C tensor in A happens to now, I gave it extra structure. And I can think of this whole space. So this is the space of linear maps from E to itself. This is the space of linear maps from this vector space to itself. And this big space, this four-way tensor product has a natural structure and there's a natural element, uh, a preferred element in that space Namely, there's our favorite matrix, the identity matrix. But now you have to have a slight psychological adjustment because this is the identity matrix on the space of matrices. Sorry, it's part of life. And so in fact, we have a stronger result that you can get every um, tensor network tensor realized by realizable by this construction by just taking our allowed changes of bases in each of our vector spaces and hitting it on the iterated matrix multiplication tensor. So if we're in this unbalanced case where D is equal to M squared, there's a very simple description of every single tensor that I can construct by a tensor network construction, just starting with iterated matrix multiplication, changing bases and applying projections. It's, it's a, a, a beautiful picture. And the same is true in the cyclically invariant case. Now, now I wanna bring up a little bit of geometry. So, um, so these are all M by M matrices. And these are the invertible. But I can get a non-invertible matrix by taking a limit of invertible ones, just letting the determinant go to zero. And so this space, which is our tensor network space, sits inside. I can take the group action Group actions are nice because every element has an inverse. I take its closure and I have some larger, a priori larger object that contains my tensor network space. Now, why would I want to do that? Because orbit closures have been studied in geometry for hundreds of years. I mean, it's a very beautiful object. So let me do a slight detour of geometry. So in general, um, if I have some group, and in our case, V will just be the space of tensors, um, and the group will be either the change of bases or the product of changes of bases. And if I have a vector in my vector space, I can look at the elements of the group that fix my vector, its stabilizer. I'll call that G sub V. And in our case, the vector I'm gonna be interested in is the matrix multiplication tensor. Then if I have something in the orbit closure of my group, the dimension of the set of elements of the group <coughs> to preserve my my W will be at least that of that preserves my original vector. And equality occurs if and only if V and W are isomorphic. Now, if I have something in the image under endomorphisms, then either it's something isomorphic, just changing bases, or I've had to hit my vector V with something with determinant zero. Any questions? 
In our case, if my tensor is in my tensor network, so this says that this is constructible via our tensor network construction, then either it has to be in the orbit, that is to say it's just isomorphic to what we started with, or it's not concise. So concise means that our tensor lives in a smaller space. So our original tensor lived in CD, tensored itself n times, and one of these CDs gets demoted to a CD minus one. So now I can tell you the proof. To show that this set is not closed, first of all, find a tensor in the orbit closure which has a larger symmetry group than iterated matrix multiplication, then we know it's either a degeneration um, or uh, it's not concise, and then show it's not concise so it cannot be obtained as an endomorphism. And to be very concrete about this, I know I'm running low on time, um, let's take the following curve. So this is a curve in this group. It's just a linear curve, x0 plus tx1, y0 plus ty1, z0 plus tz1. So it's a very simple object. x0, y0, and z1 will be projections onto the space of diagonal matrices. x1, y1, and z0 will be projections to off diagonal matrices. So explicitly, for example, if x0 plus tx1 acts by a two by two matrix, the off diagonal elements get multiplied by t and the diagonal elements, nothing happens to. And then you do a computation that the um, stabilizer of the iterated matrix multiplication tensor, it's dimension three m squared minus one. We take the limit under this action and we get a new tensor, I call it t. I put the brackets around so I don't have to worry about the constants. We don't care about things except up to scale. And this has a larger stabilizer. And then you check that it's concise. And um, if you have more factors, the proof is identical. And so that's the idea. And um, when you have uh, even larger uh, physical dimension, you can reduce to the case I just discussed via a natural vector bundle construction which for the geometers, they know what it is. And for those of you who are not, I cannot explain it in 120 seconds. Okay, let me briefly say something about work in progress. Um, so now we no longer have the beauty of an orbit closure. So we have to think of something else to do. And the idea is, well, there's two ideas. I'll only have time to present one of them, which is just to work directly. Now, um, it's pretty easy to see that this particular tensor is inside uh, our set of tensor network states in either version. And um, if I take the orbit of E1 to the n minus one, tensor E2, uh, that is the limit of this thing as t goes to zero. So the, I think some people call this the W state, if you will. So whatever this thing is, I have just exhibited it as a limit of things of this form. And these things are all inside here. So it must be in the closure. And the goal is to show that it is not inside this tensor network variety, the tensor network set. Um, so recall... Uh, if I have a matrix, so here's some basic linear algebra that you probably forgot, uh, except Shumuel, who certainly remembers this. If you have an M by M matrix, uh, you can express its higher powers in terms of the identity matrix, the matrix, the matrix squared, et cetera, namely its characteristic polynomial and the coefficients of that polynomial are just eigenvalues. So really when you take high powers of a matrix, you can express it in terms of lower powers. And so um, when I look at the traces of just some very special ones, then um, if this is a large number, 
I can express it in terms of these smaller ones, and I get lots of identities. If I want to set all these to zero, except the one that corresponds to this, um, then I get a lot of equations. And the idea is that if all these equations hold, then that last equation, the coefficient of this guy, must also be zero. So the plan is obvious. Uh, carrying out is, is um, turns into some exercise about symmetric functions that um, may or may not be easy. <coughs> and um, we have another, right? There's another idea that we could look at more general words and perhaps get a better result. If you're paying close attention, you'll see where the three um, M comes up, uh, but I'm not gonna go there if you're not paying close attention. And I end almost on time and thank you for your attention.